Usually when capitalism is critiqued online, especially in passing on social media, many will point to its symptoms and the upsetting results of its failures. By no means am I saying it's a bad idea to make emotional arguments against this unfair system, but sometimes it's nice to take a break from the pure doom-scrolling depression porn to instead critique capitalism through the lens of economics. Sure, many leftists love to shun economics as an academic discipline, and I get it, it's annoying to feel forced to talk like an economist sometimes, but like sociology, it gives us the language and definitions to pinpoint the specific failures of poorly structured societal systems. With that said, I'd like to pinpoint three concepts that highlight some of the biggest flaws in capitalism, inelastic demand, the velocity of money, and labor capacity. Let's start with the worst and most obvious of them all, inelastic demand. In a market, there are two types of demand, elastic and inelastic. Think of it like a rubber band. When your demand is elastic, it means that you can stretch it out and change it. A good example would be the cost of coffee. When a cup is only $2, you might expand your demand and buy more. But when the price goes up, let's say to $4 a cup, you contract your demand and buy less of them. You don't need coffee for survival, so your demand can accommodate the price. Meanwhile, inelastic demand means you cannot stretch your consumption to reflect the price. Things such as housing and healthcare fit into this category. The reason inelastic demand is such a problem in this system is because it leverages control to the side of the capitalist instead of the consumer, allowing the capitalist to price gouge without consequence since the consumer cannot adjust their demand to keep them in check. Eventually, this leads a lot of people to attempt to treat inelastic demand like elastic demand, such as the case with insulin, where there are plenty of examples of people rationing it to cope with the rising price, leading to many unnecessary deaths from this practice. This problem is already well known by both working class people and politicians, and it has made the concept of antitrust laws a lot more popular because it targets the monopolies that contribute to the exploitation of inelastic demand. But as is the case in Western plutocracies, capitalists have more of a say than the working person, so I don't expect their monopolies to change anytime soon. See, a capitalist doesn't really consider it murder if you can't afford the resources of which you need to survive, and because of this wishy-washy line of responsibility, it's hard to hold them accountable for their wanton actions in regard to human life. We can actually see this fatal predation in real time, since some products can shift between inelastic and inelastic demand based on changing market conditions. The biggest example of this in modern history is electricity in Texas. During winter storms or power outages, electric companies in Texas have been known for outrageously price gouging families for electricity when their demand for it becomes inelastic due to requiring it to survive the cold. It's what's led to people paying $16,000 on their electric bill and a young boy dying from the cold in an unheated home. Really at that point, I don't think there's evidence any more definitive than this that capitalists will focus on inelastic demand and even kill people over it because it's pretty much the most profitable thing they can do in this system, and it's what leads to a lot of these news articles that leftists point out when critiquing capitalism. To put this in more blatant terms for those who don't appreciate the economic jargon, death is incredibly profitable in capitalism. People who require a product to not be on the brink of death will pay virtually anything to get that product and capitalists are aware of this. This predatory strategy isn't a result of crony capitalism or a failure of the system that can be excised. It's a core function of capitalism. There's a short story from the channel Adam Something in which he lays out how an anarcho-capitalist society can accidentally end up doing socialism over time because they will realize that making a market out of inelastic demands conflicts with the core principle that makes markets work, an equal opportunity amongst all people to participate. If a citizen is unable to participate in the market due to lack of access to an adequate education or healthcare, that market is no longer functional or stable. When this issue is accounted for by decommodifying needs, or inelastic demands, and only distributing luxury goods, elastic demands on the market, the system is no longer considered capitalism, but instead market socialism. Since fixing the issue means you're no longer practicing capitalism, it thus proves that the problem is inherent to capitalism. With all of that said, let's move on to a concept that's more straightforward than inelastic demand, the velocity of money. Usually, when the worth of money is measured, we're talking about buying power in terms of inflation or the relative strength of global markets when comparing the value of their respective currencies. What's left out when defining the worth of money is the velocity of money, which is surprisingly easier to calculate than either of the two aforementioned measures. Basically put, the velocity of money grows when that money spends more time in circulation. For example, if I pay someone at Subway to make me a sandwich for $20, that $20 is paid to the worker through wages. Thus, that money now has a velocity of $40 because it's been used twice. 2 times 20 is 40. If that worker then goes and spends the $20 he earned from making me a sandwich, that $20 gains another increment in velocity, leading its total velocity to be $60. That's neat and all, but what does the life cycle of $20, let alone the velocity of any amount of money, have to do with the failures of capitalism? Well, a capitalist would argue that capital is the driving force of labor. While I understand this assumption is psychologically incorrect and extrinsic motivation is proven both not to work and be actively harmful, Zoe B has already done a video on that, and for the sake of explaining this concept, let's pretend for a while that this assumption is true. 
If so, capitalists have basically admitted that they love to restrict the flow of capital, which stifles the very labor they seem to want to encourage. Sure, on paper you would pay $20 for someone's labor, which is $20 they eventually spend themselves, but that's not what happens in the real world. You are not paid the full worth of your labor. That excess labor value, or the cut your boss takes, is the profits they skim from the value you created. A rich man is more likely to hoard capital than to spend it. They'll put it in the stock market, which leads to that money mostly circulating amongst big shareholders, usually other rich people, instead of the rest of the economy. The rich will also hoard this money in offshore bank accounts, meaning that money loses velocity since taxes aren't collected on it, nor is it being spent to inspire further labor. Hell, a lot of capitalists become wealthier just by nature of hoarding such wealth. Bank accounts pay more interest the more you have in there, stocks have higher returns the more shares you buy, and investors tend to think you're more reliable the richer you are since they buy into the myth of capitalist meritocracy. Anyways, my point here is that all of these practices encourage money to sit dormant or be shared around with individuals who are the most likely to keep that money dormant. It's within a capitalist interest that their money has low velocity, because the lower that velocity, the more capital they can accumulate, which in turn is translated into both economic and political leverage to snowball their wealth over time. A working class person cannot afford to participate in such tomfoolery. Their money is immensely more likely to be of high velocity since they'll never make enough in their lifetime for tax evasion lobbying or stock trading to be worth their time. Despite that, a working class person's money is always spent on something a capitalist eventually skims the returns from. The COVID pandemic greatly accelerated this transfer, as working people lost trillions in wealth while billionaires simultaneously gained those trillions, meaning that a lot of high-velocity working-class money is now in the hands of people who will halt that velocity. Low-velocity money isn't spent, and thus, does not encourage any new labor, meaning that overall labor investment is reduced. A capitalist instead tries to get more labor out of someone by seeing how much work they can get for the lowest wage, despite people giving better output when paid more aptly because it keeps them from job hopping, and additionally gives them money that they'll use in high velocity to encourage further labor. When a capitalist says capital is the driving force of labor, or tries to defend this with trickle-down economics, they are pretending that raising labor investment is their preferred way of encouraging labor, when their actions show that the opposite is true. They reduce investment and take as much advantage as possible of people who are unable to move or find alternative careers. They don't want to invest in labor that creates wealth, they just want to get the most for their money. And in this case, efficiency is the opposite of investment. Getting into the nitty gritty again, there are ways in which a capitalist or CEO is able to measure and define whether or not they have enough employees to get done what is demanded of the business, and due to being able to make these calculations, are also aware of exactly how close they are to the line between having enough employees and not being able to force their current amount to meet demands. There is a model for defining these lines, and it's the three stages of labor capacity. Think of the labor requirements of a company like using batteries to run an electric motor. In a class 1 business, adding new employees leads to an increase in profits. As per the metaphor, the company doesn't have enough batteries yet to run the motor at top speed, so obviously adding more will make it run faster. Meanwhile, a class 2 business no longer generates additional revenue from more employees. In this case, the business already has enough energy with their current batteries to run the motor, so clearly no more are needed. However, if we do decide to keep adding them, it eventually leads a business to be in class 3, where we start to lose profits with every successive employee. The motor gets more power than it needs, and while it still runs, it'd be silly and inefficient to try to run a 5 volt motor with a 9 volt battery. Obviously, a business will try and avoid class 3 as much as possible since that eats into their profits, but recently, the practice of riding the line between class 1 and class 2 has become more popular and is now known as working with a skeleton crew. This means that they're forcing inadequate employment to achieve the capabilities of a more properly staffed business. It's like forcing an inadequate amount of batteries to still run that electric motor. Sure, it can be done, but the consequence is that it cannot be maintained for long. Those batteries, due to being inadequate to run the motor, or the labor requirements of the business, will burn out faster and not be nearly as useful. See, you cannot cheat your way into running that 5 volt motor with 2 volt batteries overworking themselves to pretend to be 5 volt ones. One employee cannot be forced to continually do the work of two. You don't magically make individuals output more labor without there being some kind of sacrifice to get there. Usually, this sacrifice is either a higher investment into labor, which capitalists consider inefficient, or less consistent labor output. It's impossible for someone to give their 100% all of the time. An individual's peak output cannot be turned into consistent output, and as such, a business's total labor output will suffer as a result of trying to increase it without investment. I'm sure there are plenty of other economic concepts that further prove the weak points within modern capitalism, but these three are what I'd consider the most prevalent, especially since the symptoms of these specific issues are being watched under a microscope in the public eye. Understaffing, greedflation, and scalping are all symptoms of the concepts I described, and are simultaneously hot-button issues that get the most attention in terms of recent economic news. What's refreshing now is that we understand the economic concepts that specifically explain how these things come about.